Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Weiler. I'm a professor emeritus at the Peter A. Allard School of Law at UBC, and I'm co-director of the Anti-Corruption Law Program, along with my friend and colleague, John Ritchie. So welcome to the second monthly webinar of the Anti-Corruption Law Program for uh, 2021. Uh, the program is a joint uh, working partnership between the Center for Business Law at the Peter A. Allard School of Law, Transparency International Canada, uh, of which I have the pleasure or privilege of being the vice chair, and the International Center for Criminal Law Reform, uh, ICLEAR. So the, the program um, is, is uh, you know, has uh, been, in, going for about four years now. We had a year off last year because of COVID. Uh, and we, this is the 24th uh, seminar or conference that has been uh, put on through the program. And it's, it's these three organizations that I mentioned uh, essentially took collective action uh, to bring together the, um, uh, the experts in the field of anti-corruption to basically teach each other. Uh, and teach each other about the best ways of fighting corruption. So I want to give a special thanks uh, today to Dr. Carol Liao, who's the director of, of the Center for Business Law, and uh, Charles Lee, the associate director, for the kind of uh, expert uh, technical uh, support in the uh, hosting of this program. It's really, we've really stepped it up as a result of their support uh, for this year. So it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, uh, and that is Dr. Daniela Chimiso dos Santos, uh, who's checking in from Rio de Janeiro in uh, Brazil. Uh, and she's a member of the Anti-Corruption Law Program Working Group. She's a longtime supporter uh, and panelist uh, and, and moderator of uh, sessions uh, over the past few years of the, of the program. Uh, she's also uh, uh, on the board of directors uh, with me of Transparency International Canada, and she's the principal consultant of Invenient Solutions Consulting Incorporated. Uh, Daniela is a leading expert in the field of uh, ESG. She's got 20 years experience uh, as in-house counsel at some of the world's great companies, uh, Shell, Ballet, uh, Hatch, uh, and it's my pleasure to turn things over to you, Daniela, uh, to moderate uh, today's session. Over to you. Thank you so much, Joe. It's absolutely my pleasure. I am delighted to be um, to be part of this panel and to be moderating this panel. We have um, numerous incredible experts that will be sharing their knowledge with us today. It really is a delight. So perhaps we can start off, and I just wanted to take um, a moment just to mention sort of the structure of what we're looking at today for the agenda. So we have two hours slotted to us. So the idea is to spend the first hour in which our experts will present um, their viewpoints on certain core aspects of, of, uh, of our topic today, which is ultim ultimately anti-corruption and, and procurement. And after this one hour, our intent is to open up for questions and answers, and we'd be delighted to take questions from the audience. We also have a number of, of, of questions. I have a number of questions that I'm dying to be able to ask. So I think that it will be, um, it will be quite an active uh, question and answers process. So perhaps if, um, if we can all join in as panelists, I think that that would be super helpful just so that we can introduce the panel, if that would be okay. Because I think that, that I think that's great. Thank you. So that we can all see each other. Just 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 as I'm doing the introductions, I wanted to take a minute to introduce. But it would be a lie that it's not actually a minute. It's going to be quite a few minutes because we have such an incredible amount of experts. So first of all, I'd like to introduce David Hubner. He's vice president of Infrastructure BC. Um, his focus is on the transportation and utility sectors. He has a master's of business administration, finance, and an economics degree. And he spent. 10 years in the banking sector and corporate finance area prior to his work in procurement. For the past 14 years, David has been involved in the procurement of numerous major capital projects in the transportation, mm -hmm. energy, and accommodation sectors. Joe Ringworld is president from, of GeoComp International Consulting and former president and CEO of Scozinc Mining. 
He has been within the mining industry for more than 35 years, both in mining and construction. He has held senior management experience um, in he has held senior management experience in exploration, development, operation, and consulting companies. He's worked all over the world in numerous countries around five continents. His current and past avocation activities and affiliations include member, he's a member of the Canadian Mirror Committee to the ISO for anti bribery, member of the Canadian Securities Mining Advisory and Technical Monitoring Committee, committee past director of Transparency International Canada. Founding executive committee of the Center for Excellence in Corporate Social Responsibility, member of the CIM Mineral Resource and Mineral Reserves Committee, and assisted in the development of the Extractive Sector Transparency Measures Act. Thank you, Joe. We also have John Singleton, who's a partner at Singleton Reynolds LLP. John is known throughout the legal world as being probably one of the top, top, top partners in the in the construction and insurance and liability and environmental matters. Offer, he offers extensive experience in major infrastructure projects and public-private partnership, as well as com complex commercial disputes. We also have Neil Stansbury, all the way from the UK. Neil comes with 35 years in the international infrastructure sector. He has been involved in over 75 major projects in 20 countries. Since 2002, he has worked full-time on the development, promotion, assessment, and implementation of anti-corruption measures. He is past chairman of the International Organization for Standardization Anti-Bribery Project Committee, which published ISO 37001, past chairman of British Standards Institution Anti-Bribery Working Group, and past vice chairman of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations Anti-Corruption Standing Committee. He was, um, he was an independent anti-corruption compliance monitor of Balfour Beatty, Parsons, Brickenhorf, and maybe Bridge, and he has given anti-corruption presentations in more than 25 countries all over the world. And I should also mention that he is co-author of various anti-corruption tools, including the Global Infrastructure Anti-Corruption Center. Finally, we have pa Paul Townsend. Paul is a chartered accountant and certified inter intern excuse me, and certified internal auditor with over 30 years of experience with risk management, audit, and compliance. Mm -hmm. Paul. Paul and Joe and I actually, we've been in a number of panels together, so it's great to be back, but Paul has been for 16 years. He was a chief risk officer, v VP audit, and chief compliance officer for the TK group of companies, leading a global team that was responsible for risk management, audit, global anti-corruption efforts, and training and investigations. He was also vice chair of the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network and past president of the Institute of Internal Auditors. He has now started his own practice and he's, he, and he's been leading companies on implementing anti-corruption compliance best practices. He has spoken widely on topics of business ethics, compliance best practices, whistleblower heartlines, internal auditing best practices, and collective action. Once again, I couldn't be more delighted to welcome this extraordinary panel. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, the first thing that we will do, we will spend the next hour just having our panelists um, go through their core topics. And we'll start off with Neil Stansbury. Thank you very much, Daniela. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be in this uh, workshop. So I'll just wait for the slides to, to come up on the screen. And next slide. And next slide, please. Thank you. So <clears throat> I'm going to give a very brief 10 minute overview of integrity in procurement uh, being 16 key principles. As it's only 10 minutes, it's going to be a flying overview with very much looking at the principle because each principle could be an R in itself. But just a bit of background, the Global Infrastructure Anti-Corruption Center, GIAC, our organization, is an international independent anti uh, not-for-profit organization founded in 2008 and we work on promoting and implementing anti-corruption measures as an integral part of government, corporate and project management. We believe that you cannot stop corruption just by turning off a switch. Stopping corruption is about management and control uh, from a corporate perspective and those management controls have to be implemented into an organization, into the government, into corporations, holistically. We publish on our website <clears throat> at www.gxcenter.org free 
of charge online information, advice and resources to help people um, understand and fight corruption. And we work based in the UK, but we work internationally and we've got alliances and um, affiliates worldwide. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to cover 16 what I regard as the key procurement principles, which must be present in every procurement. Next slide, please. Firstly, impartiality. Decisions as to design, specification, tender, invitation, evaluation of bids, selection of winning bid, all key decisions in a procurement process must be impartial. They must be on an arm's length objective basis without any undue favor being provided to any party. That is obvious. The whole purpose of procurement, which is a well controlled, particularly public sector procurement, is it must be impartial and not allow friends, relatives, neighbors, etc., to win the bid. It must be impartial. Secondly, discretion must be minimized. The discretion and evaluation should as far as possible be minimized by using objective bid criteria. Obviously, price is one of the most objective, but most procurements don't rely only on price. They rely on quality, program, skills, experience, etc. Some of these are marginally objective and marginally subjective, but the more subjectivity you allow to creep into an evaluation, the more ability there is for someone corruptly to manipulate the evaluation uh, in return for a bribe or, or other personal benefit. And it's very difficult to audit subjective decisions. So as far as possible, discretion should be minimized and there should be objective bid criteria. Thirdly, clarity. All aspects of the procurement requirements, design, specification, and the contract should be complete, clear, well-defined, and unambiguous. Corruption thrives in ambiguity and uncertainty. <clears throat> the more people are unsure about the requirements, the more opportunity there is <clears throat> excuse me, for people to make decisions based on a corrupt reason rather than an, an, an objective and ethical reason. So everything must be as clear, complete and unambiguous as possible in the procurement requirements. Fourthly, inevitably, the process should maximize competition. As far as reasonable, bids should be selected from as wide a range of appropriately qualified bidders as possible. <clears throat> you must maximize the competition the smaller the competitive group, the more likelihood there is of a cartel price fixing or friendly companies being selected. In many bids, it is necessary to pre-qualify the bidders because the technical skills required are such you cannot open it to everyone. If that is the case, you must then make sure the pre-qualification process is open to the widest possible group as possible because it is a very well-tracked corruption mechanism to exclude companies falsely during a pre-qualification process to ensure that only the corrupt bidders are left during the actual bid evaluation. So competition must be as wide as possible. Next slide, please. Competence. All those involved in the design, evaluation, approval process on behalf of the procuring en entity must be appropriately trained and be competent to perform their function. Again, corruption thrives amidst incompetence and uncertainty. Make sure your people are good and know what they're doing. And from the bidder's perspective, all bidders must be competent to perform the contract in terms of their experience and their financial, technical, management and personnel resources. Do not allow corrupt com companies owned by friends or by ministers or people who have no skill to be interposed into the contractual structure all the bidders must have the competence themselves. Six, separation of functions. As far as possible, functions of the procuring entity should be separated. Those involved in selecting a winning bidder during the procurement process should not as far as possible be involved in preparation of the design or proving work or proving payment. This is obvious. If the same person can appoint the bidder, prepare the design, approve their work and um, pay them, that is rife for corruption. So therefore, separate the process as far as possible. 
makes it more difficult. Next slide, please. Level of approval, obvious, the seniority of the persons approving any element of the procurement process on behalf of the procuring entity should be appropriate to the value and risk of the relevant process. High value or risk processes should require the approval of a more senior person. Very high value or risk processes should require the approval of the board. And the value and the corruption risk are of course different. You can have high value and low risk or low risk and, or, or high risk and low value. So they're separate decisions. The number of approvals likewise should depend on the value of the risk. The higher the risk, the higher the value, the greater the number of people involved in addition to the greater the seniority. Next slide, please. Integrity commitments, all persons involved in the process, whether on behalf of the procuring entity or the bidders, should be required to comply with integrity commitments, such as a code of conduct or contractual commitment. Under these commitments, they commit to behave lawfully and with integrity, not to bribe, not to be in a cartel, not to commit fraud, etc. Any breach of this commitment must lead to disciplinary action. For example, bidders should be disqualified, should face criminal action, procurement officers who are uh, involved should be disciplined and face criminal action if appropriate. And critically also, uh, we believe that all bidders for public sector contracts over a reasonable value threshold should be required to provide third party certification of their compliance with ISO 37001 as a pre-qualification requirement. Just as you have to provide proof of your quality through an ISO 9001 certification and your safety through a 45001 certification, you should have to prove your integrity program through providing a certified ISO 37001 program as a pre-qualification requirement. Next slide, please. You must disclose when you're in the procurement process any conflict of interest. And also if you're a bidder, you should disclose fully your beneficial ownership throughout the contractual chain. Any conflict of interest should be appropriately dealt with. No one with a conflict of interest should be entitled to participate in the relevant process. Independent monitoring, not done, but very critical. All public sector procurement processes above a specified minimum value should be independently monitored by a person of appropriate skill who's authorized to have full access to the records, offices, sites, and personnel of all parties, and who must report suspicions of corrupt conduct to the authorities. There's no doubt at all that appropriate independent monitoring of the whole procurement and construction process is a massive corruption deterrent. 12, there must be the ability to challenge. Any bidder who feels they've been unfairly treated or in breach of regulations must be entitled to complain to an appropriate person and must understand and believe that their complaint will be appropriately investigated and dealt with promptly and impartially. Next slide, please. The procuring entity should maintain and publicize a reporting system under which any person who believes there has been any corruption or breach of regulations can report their concerns openly or confidentially or anonymously. And there must be accountability to these reports. So any report should be investigated by the procuring entity by an appropriate person and appropriate action must be taken if such instances are proven. An appropriate action could be disqualification from tender, dismissal of staff, or criminal action if it's a proven bribery incident. Transparency 15, critical and does not happen. All public sector procuring entities should fully disclose to the public all elements of the procurement process, including design, specification, identity of bidders, prices, contract terms, and all other key aspects of the bids, the bid evaluation and the bid award. Any public sector project is public money. We, the public, have the right to know everything about the bid process and about the evaluation. Of course, confidentiality must be maintained during the evaluation, but once the process is over, the public must be entitled to know everything. Commercial confidentiality does not trump public interest in the use of public sector money. And finally, records. All processes and decisions must be recorded in writing and must be retained securely as a permanent record. 
Next slide, please. So that's the brief summary of the 16 core principles we believe are necessary for procurement. They all work in tandem. You can't pick and choose those principles. If all of those principles are properly followed and the whole process is independently um, carried out objectively with proper people, well-trained, with proper integrity commitments, with independent monitoring and full transparency and action if there's any breach of those requirements. The whole procurement process can be managed with integrity and give people, both the bidders and the public, confidence that the procurement process has been carried out openly, objectively, transparently, and providing good value for money for the public sector. Thank you. I guess I'm next. Is my video showing? Yes, Joe, that's right. Yes, and your video is showing. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, it's not showing up on my screen. Okay, so I'll assume I'm showing up for everybody else. Uh, I'm going to look at, uh, my presentation will look at a very high level, uh, more of a corporate perspective of uh, procurement of services and products. Um, Neil provided a great deal of granularity, which uh, I wholly support and agree with. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit more, uh, some degree of philosoph uh, philosophical from a, a corporate perspective. So first, um, procurement is not just about price. Um, when we procure for uh, effectively whatever service, uh, I'd like to look at the, uh, the scope and with the full expectation that scope is going to change. Uh, QAQC, um, when, who's going to be following up to make sure that the services and products are of significant and, and acceptable uh, quality? Timelines are always a factor. Expect the timelines to change. And perhaps something that uh, a lot of people forget about when they get focused on cost, they forget about that the relationship is, um, is critical to the whole process. Stuff happens. How are parties gonna handle things? How are you gonna handle things when it's, the, it's on the buyer's perspective or, or on the vendor's perspective? What happens when a force majeure happens? Um, the relationships get strained and things happen um, because we're all humans and we respond in different ways. So all of these aspects, including cost, which relate to cost, are vulnerable to corruption from within and from without. Um, and I think from a corporate perspective, you have to have a, put everybody within your team under a microscope and make sure that they are the team that you need and expect will provide the integrity that you you uh, look for for the project. Otherwise, the bottom line from a corporate perspective is vulnerable. From without, it takes a little bit more effort. Um, next slide. So when we're doing this, expect that nothing is foolproof. Um, can you eliminate corruption? No, just, just accept that. What you could do is safeguard and put put a shine a big light on uh, inside and outside to reduce the corruption as best as possible. And you have to also have to look from a corporate perspective, how do you protect your company? So one of those is uh, tools is to conduct what I call a thorough due diligence. Um, too often we see corporations going into jurisdictions and in the mining industry, which I come from, um, we often go into foreign jurisdictions and the focus seems to be largely on the, the risk analysis of your cost and revenue profiles without having a closer look at the, the jurisdiction itself, the politics of that, the culture within those jurisdictions and in your own um, corporate 
culture um, along the entire supply chain. And having a close look at the peoples and companies that you're going to be involved with as you're developing and operating a project. So it's not just the financial investment um, and risk analysis. You need to expect that there will be illicit knocks on the door. Uh, when I worked in the Middle East, there was a proverb there, trust in Allah, but tie up your camel. Um, and I think that applies to everything in our lives, that hope for the best, but expect the worst, you know, plan for the worst. Um, that's what that, that proverb is talking about. And I think that behooves the uh, management and corporations to do that. Um, too often I see uh, people going into your jurisdictions and, get, uh, and investors expecting the great return without understanding that if there is a great return that you see and others see it, somebody's going to go after that. And they're not always your friends. I uh, absolutely agree with uh, one aspect that Neil talked about is a remedy system. You need some way to detect and correct procurement issues, including corruption. And that should include, from a corporate perspective, the willingness to write off your investment. Because uh, in the end, you still have to protect your corporation. Next slide. One of these things to, to consider is that everybody has a price. Everybody on this call and who's watching has a price. Um, two questions to consider. Do I have something that somebody wants? And you'd be surprised what you have that somebody wants. And then what's my price? And consider these as vulnerabilities with respect to procurement, that what you have may be inconsequential in your mind, but it could be important to somebody who's seeking it. Next slide. Uh, hit it uh, next again a couple of times to get the full slide here. There you go. So look at it from a corruption continuum perspective. Um, a lot of people focus on, and consider corruption as bribery, the middle part. But on a continuum perspective, it's everything that you see here. And the most vulnerable area is in the circle. The behaviors and aspects of how you get into the continuum, those are your vulnerabilities. Nepotism, partisanship, an obligation, somebody giving you a favor. Uh, you remember the lines of the perspective that we hear all for decades of, I do this favor for you, and one day I'm going to call and ask a favor from you. These things are the entrances into that continuum, and they start to build. So the gateways, I've shown a few here. Um, the one that I think is really quite interesting is lighting a cigarette. Uh, a friend of mine was a prison guard for over 30 years. And I asked him, how is it that the inmates get drugs? Well, it's the guards that bring it to them. How does that start? It starts by the inmates getting the guard to light a cigarette, which they're not supposed to do. Eventually, they become, the guards become the mules. So think of that in a vulnerability in a procurement process, in a corporate process. And one example of that, your maintenance custodial staff have access. All they got in today's world with cameras, they can take pictures within your offices and look how exposed you are. Next slide. So procurement vulnerabilities may include construction. They could be your uh, with your contracting outfit, construction management. Think of them as an agent. You're hiring them and expecting them as the ultimate client, the one who's paying the bills. You're expecting them to do a good job. Are you, how are you overseeing their activities as your agent and face of the company? Services, the vulnerabilities there with consultants, caterers, security, maintenance, that I mentioned maintenance and custodial staff, the vulnerability there, they have access. Your communications, 
do you have your firewalls and protections on communications and electronics? Equipment, um, think of your equipment, your fixed, your mobile, your office, field equipment, the people who have access to that and that ability to make that equipment vulnerable. And trust me, in certain jurisdictions, that is a key issue when you are expected to perform and your operation needs to be operationally and cost effective. And all of a sudden you get a breakdown. How are you going to deal with that? And so it's not just buying the equipment, it's the service behind it. Your materials, when you're in a certain jurisdictions and sometimes even in your domestic jurisdictions, what's your supply chain to get critical parts and consumables that you need on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? And that relates then to expediting your local, regional, and international, and your transit uh, infrastructure, your ports, highways, airports. All of this is tied into your vulnerabilities. Next slide. So this is where the, um, what I believe is your key uh, uh, path to solution and protection is appropriate corporate culture. Uh, this is critical to your entire procurement and investment integrity. It begins top down and finishes bottom up. It's not finished until it's working bottom up. And that includes the ability of subordinates to hold to account their superiors. Then you have a full working and functional team. Expect that uh, actions speak more than words. Putting out uh, anti-corruption policy is just words. Making it effective within your corporation is critical. And that means enforce and reinforce that your policies and your culture as the company evolves. You do a new acquisition, you build a new mine, something changes, you got a new team, you um, add uh, companies and corporations to that team, go through the process again. Understand that that culture that you're developing in that team is more important than the assets themselves. And last but not least, corporate governance versus project governance. At a corporate level, we see it all the time. Uh, you put out your corporate policies, you put them on your, your website. This is your code of conduct and so on. These uh, are the words and hopefully they represent the culture. That corporate governance is not necessarily the same as your project governance. At project levels, things differ. They got a higher level of granularity and that that aspect is not always captured within your expectation of corporate governance. But your project governance must complement and come within your overall high level corporate governance. Um, an example of that is you may have a CSR policy, but social license to operate is at the project level. CSR is, not, is largely perceived at the corporate level. All of this contributes to your corporate culture and your team. Your team is your greatest safeguard. You can have as many enforcements and armed guards and police and consultants as much as you, as much as you want. But if the team is, uh, has got chicks in the armor, somebody's going to be looking for those chicks. Thanks. Oh, good morning, everybody. My name is David Hubner with Infrastructure BC. And I'm just going to provide a bit of a case study uh, in terms of the approach that we take to procurement. And I think just uh, as David, a start. Sorry. Yeah, so, sorry to interrupt you, David. I was wondering if you could please turn on your video. Thank yeah, you. there it goes. It was just being, Thank blocked. You. It's being blocked before. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's great. Morning, everybody. I just wanted to start by saying, uh, I think that in Canada and British Columbia, it's important to recognize that we benefit a lot from a stable uh, legal and commercial environment um, 
within which we work. And so a big part of what we do is about uh, you know, not being complacent uh, and having a process and a structure in place when we do procurements um, that really is about uh, vigilance and uh, consistency in the uh, process. So I'll just get into some more detail about that. Next slide, please. So just quickly, a little bit about who we are. Uh, we support the public sector uh, exclusively uh, with procurement uh, in particular relating to complex uh, public infrastructure projects. And we were a fee for service uh, agency and we work as a service integrator. So we work with all kinds of uh, legal advisors, technical advisors, financial advisors, um, other stakeholders. Uh, we also are continually outreaching to the market to understand uh, market dynamics. And uh, we also work outside of uh, British Columbia, but pretty much exclusively within Canada. Uh, next slide, please. So first and foremost, where our uh, approach to procurement management starts is with a uh, relationship review process. Um, long before an actual uh, procurement starts on a, a project, uh, we establish a relationship review committee. And we're looking at um, projects that are potentially going to go into procurement and also uh, other concurrent uh, projects that are happening uh, to make sure that we understand who the, um, who the uh, potential participants are, who's working on uh, one side of a project, um, who's potentially going to be bidding on another project, is there potential access to information if somebody's working on the owner side for one project that potentially would bid on another project. And increasingly, it's critical to understand those relationships at the uh, individual level in terms of who's doing what, where, what information do they have access to, is that information going to become public. And increasingly, um, there's more uh, amalgamation amongst firms. So, you know, where you would have had two or three firms before working in different roles, if there's acquisitions or amalgamation, that whole relationship can change. And so it's important to kind of be in front of that um, as well. Uh, we also have a um, disclosure pro process during evaluation that I'll talk about in just in, about in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. So we focus on the guiding principles, I think building on what's been um, mentioned already. Uh, it's easy to gloss over these in the procurement process, but it's something that we do uh, make sure to communicate and endeavor to instill in everybody that's involved in the processes um, that we're responsible for around transparency, fairness, confidentiality, consensus, and a definitive record and really transparency, um, like was said earlier, in a nutshell, it's about being clear about what it is the procurement is asking for, how it's being evaluated, and then making sure that you do what you say you're gonna do, and people can see that you're doing that, and that there's measures to, to verify and validate that you're actually doing what you said you were gonna do. Uh, fairness is a key component of having an external uh, fairness reviewer, fairness advisor, uh, overseeing the work, having complete access to every aspect of the evaluation pro process, uh, emails, correspondence, interviews, evaluations, and um, you know that the people that are bidding also have access to the fair fairness advisor reviewer if they have concerns about the process. Uh, confidentiality is uh, critical for the market to have confidence in the process. Uh, they spend a lot of time and money on their proposals and uh, to make sure that um, nothing is at risk of being disclosed. The consensus decision is really around everybody being able to sign off at the end of the day uh, on the process and that there's not one individual or there's not uh, personalities that are driving a result, uh, that everybody uh, plays their role and is comfortable uh, in the outcome and um, can stand behind it. And then the definitive record at the end is there's one um, report that will ultimately uh, capture all of the aspects of the procurement. And I think uh, critically as well, that 
the final uh, procurement uh, documents and contract that gets executed and the price are made available publicly uh, on, on our website. Um, certainly all the projects that we're involved in, anybody can go and look at the RFQ, the RFP, uh, and the final executed contract, it, subject to some redaction where there's specific commercial issues that might be sensitive. Uh, but otherwise, uh, in terms of the overall process, it's there. Uh, next slide, please. Just uh, at a high level, uh, on all of our projects, we impose a fairly a rigorous uh, structure that's discipline-based. Um, the procurement ultimately would report to a project board and the fairness reviewer will report to the project board. We have a separate arm's length due diligence committee that does a, a more detailed dive into the technical aspects of the evaluation and the logic and consistency of application of evaluation uh, results. We have a evaluation committee that's arm's length from the actual technical team that would have been responsible for developing the specifications and play a role in evaluating proposals relative to those specifications. And ultimately the evaluation committee is responsible for the outcome of the evaluation. And they tend to be representatives from our organization and from the owner. Um, we have the relationship review committee that I mentioned and a conflict of interest adjudicator that's again, uh, an arm's length uh, opportunity for uh, final and binding decisions on relationship review matters. Uh, if, if they arise that it's not up to any particular individual within the procurement. And then we have a designated legal counsel as well supporting the process. So there's critical individual disciplines, pieces that fit together in a structured way to ensure that there's checks and balances around what's uh, already a fairly structured process. Uh, just one other critical aspect is that we have a box for uh, advisors where there would be potentially numerous people with technical expertise that's needed in order to do the evaluation but they're not actually evaluators. And so it's an opportunity to ring, fa ring fence the uh, information that a person uh, has exposure to in order to get the uh, expertise without exposing other parts of submission, submissions. And again, they're not actually involved in the final evaluation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, evaluator education orientation. So this is a, a critical aspect where for all of our projects, uh, we make sure that every single person that's involved in the evaluation uh, is oriented and educated on the evaluation principles, what they mean, why they're important, uh, their particular roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities as evaluators, uh, which is key, and ongoing relationship disclosure um, during the evaluation process. So at the beginning, anybody, they have to disclose their relationship uh, when proposals come in, the parties that are proposing are reviewed and there is a relationship review update. And again, where there's a, a financial component, any changes to the, the bidder team uh, gets reviewed and then the relationship um, review process is updated at that point uh, too. So there's a lot of time spent on that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, evaluation uh, debriefs are critical. So at the end of the day, we have to go back to the market and provide a debrief. And increasingly we've become uh, transparent in terms of how we actually do the evaluations. Uh, our limitation is we can't talk about uh, other teams' proposals, but we do say you know, in quite a bit of detail what we asked for, what they provided, how it was scored, how they ranked, and I think it's critical that fir firms that are involved in the process are comfortable with the process. They're confident in the fairness. If they're not successful, we want them to come back and uh, try again. And it's an opportunity for them to raise concerns or issues that they might've had um, or questions. And we've had um, consistently good feedback from the market in terms of the process. So it's just something that we continue to uh, pursue and be vigilant about. And I think that was the last slide. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, John. Excellent, thanks, John. Here I am. Hello, everyone. John Singleton is my name. Um, 
a bit of additional background before I get into this um, presentation on um, the role of the Fairness Monitor in uh, prevention of corruption in the public procurement process. Um, I've been in the uh, construction infrastructure legal practice, <clears throat> I'm embarrassed to say, for the past 50 years. Um, in the last decade or so, <clears throat> I have been um, heavily involved in uh, monitoring various infrastructure and construction projects as the Fairness Monitor. Uh, it was a field unheard of a dozen or 15 years ago. And then working with David's group um, uh, independently in the sense that I only get involved as a Fairness Monitor after my, uh, responding to an RFP uh, issued by uh, Infrastructure BC. <clears throat> and nowadays, um, also by invitation by a number of public sector entities such as BC Hydro. Um, so, I, so I respond to an RFP, it's actually a competition to become Fairness Monitor. I can assure you I've not, never offered a bribe or corrupted anybody to get me there. Uh, but I act in that capacity and over the past decade, <clears throat> I have monitored over a hundred uh, public infrastructure projects, mainly in the BC region, a couple in Ontario, um, for, fair, for, for abidance by or to um, fairness principles <clears throat> uh, in the uh, infrastructure process. Um, uh, the, my role has been in both uh, informative and educational, because as I said, when I started out in this end of things, there was no such thing as a fairness monitor, at least in this jurisdiction. And I learned a lot on the way through, whereas today we now have myself and three others in my firm who frequently provide, daily provide um, uh, fairness monitoring services. I'm looking at a bookshelf over here in my office. Quick count is probably 25 binders there. And they all relate to different projects we're currently monitoring for uh, compliance with uh, fairness principles. <clears throat> so in, in, um, in light of the length of time we each have to speak here, I'm going to go to my second slide. It's probably my last slide. Uh, I don't know who put this, the fairness clock at the top, but it's very descriptive of what I've put out here. It's actually 12 boxes representing what generally speaking we do in uh, the fairness monitoring role uh, in an effort to weed out, uh, mediate sometimes, um, identify uh, practices that are going in the wrong direction and would not uh, pass a fairness test. For instance, one of my, er in the early days, one of the um, uh, events I recall <clears throat> that was clearly a transgression of fairness principles was that the lead procurement officer for the project, and it was a $420 million project, was in partnership uh, with the CEO of one of the proponents uh, on another project offshore, offshore of Vancouver. <clears throat> and uh, I learned this early on in the process and I said to him or her, uh, you are in a terrible conflict of interest here and you must withdraw. And it took over three or four weeks. So this is early on in the identification of fairness principles. It took three or four weeks to actually convince this person and those are both above and below this person that her continuing to act as procurement lead was not appropriate. And so she withdrew and was replaced by someone who did not have that conflict of interest. So I look at a number of things on the way through. Um, once chosen as Fairness Monitor, I am truly independent. I do get approached by both uh, the sponsoring entity, whether it's highways, uh, BC Hydro, um, school boards, uh, a lot of health districts, a lot of hospitals being built in our jurisdiction at the present time. Uh, uh, I'm approached by them to become fairness monitor and it's always made very clear as David mentioned that I'm also available to the proponents, <clears throat> which is an important feature of this. This can't be seen as a one sided check on fairness because that in and of itself might be a breach of fairness principles. It must be a holistic 
approach to fairness, giving both sides, both public sector and proponents, access to someone who can give them advice as to whether what is happening is fair from their perspective. So just quickly, what I look at on the way through, this is what this slide is about. I'll review the procurement documentation early on before it even hits the marketplace. To make sure there's nothing in there that's um, inviting uh, bids or uh, proposals uh, uh, pursuant to principles, which in and of themselves would be unfair, or undisclosed principles, which haven't been uh, uh, put into the procurement documentation. For instance, uh, a preferred preference for some group of uh, proponents or some type of equipment to be supplied to the project. And catching those things early on is very helpful so you don't have to unwind once you're into the process. So I look at the procurement documentation. I submit a quick report on that. So I've reviewed it and hopefully have not found any breach of fairness principles. If I have, I give some advice as to how they might be corrected. I review the, there is a relationship committee on most of these projects, a relationship review committee. They do look at relationships between and amongst proponents and the project sponsor. I just check to make sure that's happened and that nothing's passing through the gate, so to speak, that would represent a relationship which transgresses a fairness principle. I also brief the project participants early on um, in the process, even before they, they do see the RFP. Uh, there'll be a public um, town hall meeting, so to speak, and I will brief them on fairness principles at that point of time, both proponents and uh, project sponsors. Uh, I, and where there are subject matter experts, as mentioned by David, they too get a briefing from me and from the project team, uh, focusing on the critical importance for them to um, abide by fairness principles. And at that SME level, there's a huge opportunity for corruption and unfairness by specifying, designing something known to be uh, um, more acceptable to one or more proponents than others, and therefore almost automatically disqualifying um, one or two or more proponents before the process even begins because they can't meet the SME's um, take on, on the uh, uh, design of the project. I will then monitor our, the exchange of RFCs and RFIs. This is a tricky process. Uh, contractors, as has been observed by other speakers here today, are very wise and smart as to how to get to the uh, other side of corruption and bribery. And one way to do that is by asking a huge number of RF um, eyes and sometimes getting a commitment for the project sponsor to amend things or do things in a certain way that satisfies the proponent and thereby giving the proponent an advantage over the competition. So I monitor those on the way through, both the requests and the responses. I monitor correspondence between the contact person of the project. This is an important feature of the way Infrastructure BC runs its projects. Uh, there's always one person and one person only on each side through whom all correspondence and communication is to be made. I will monitor that as fairness monitor as it goes through again the garden gate uh, hopefully without the breach of any fairness principles. I, I will, I can, I'm advised of all meetings that are scheduled on the project. Sometimes there's a dozen, sometimes there's a hundred. I don't attend them all. Uh, where there are, are overlaps, as I say, we have others here who work with me on some of these projects where they can, we can attend three or four meetings in one day because we have three or four people who are uh, briefed on uh, the skills needed by uh, a fairness monitor. So, but we certainly do attend the collaborative meetings nowadays by Zoom, of course. Can't speak to anybody, you can't see the, the uh, white of their eyes and you can't watch their body language to determine whether or not they're telling you the truth, but it works. And we attend uh, collaborative meetings by Zoom meetings. That's in its of itself, again, I guess raises um, a keen attention to fairness principles when you're only communicating um, virtually rather than in person. 
I review the final report of the evaluation committee before it's delivered to the project board. I review any outstanding fairness issues at that juncture to make sure they're resolved before the project board is engaged in its uh, approval of the uh, recommendation of the evaluation committee. I submit my own report to the project board. Um, it, it, um, it overlaps what the evaluation committee has recommended. Mine deals just with the issue is, was this a fair process or all these principles that we've all heard about complied with? And then I meet with the project board and, and address any questions they may have about uh, the my report or the process itself. So believe it or not, there's 12 boxes there. I guess that's why somebody called it the fairness clock. It's generally speaking what I do on each project. The balance of my slides, I might just go through them really quickly. Um, let me go to the next slide. So those are just the touchstones of fairness that I <clears throat> have identified. I won't review them so, uh, in any detail. Transparency, no collusion, no lobbying. Confidentiality is, is kept continually reminding evaluation committees, you can go to Starbucks and talk about uh, the proposals that have been submitted and what you think about them. That's a, a no-go. It's been done before and papers have been left on tables, uh, uh, which are open to the public eye. I look at what the relational conflicts would make sure there's no financial conflicts like that chair I referred to at the outset. Is there consistency in the evaluation? There's no bias, equal treatment. Next slide. Um, this is simply how is fairness monitored? I look at the rules of procurement, the adherence to the rules. The evaluation guidelines, again, are, are reviewed and monitored by me and reported on. Adherence to the guidelines and make sure the evaluation is objective. Objectivity has been identified as an important feature of fairness. And has there been due diligence? And then, um, the uh, next slide, please. So, so John, thank you so much. I think that we'll have some some uh, a chance to go into into a lot of this at, at a deeper level once we got to the Q and A's. Um, yeah, that, I'm fine with that. I thought I okay, perfect. Really needed just the first slide, so the rest of it really just enlarges upon what the first slide dealt with. So there you are. Thank you very much, and that's it for fairness monitoring. Thank you, John. All right, well, we're on to, uh, to me. And, uh, you know, my experience is primarily within the private sector, but I do have some government experience as well. And, and my comments are based on about 30 years of uh, risk assessing and, and building in uh, mitigating controls into procurement systems, training in anti-corruption, and investigating and dealing with abuses. So I hope this will be uh, quite practical and, and useful for you. You know, the first thing uh, that you have to do is formalize your, your procurement policy and procedures. Um, you know, otherwise everyone just does what they think is best. And I've seen this in a lot of companies um, and it's really just open season for abuse. Um, and as you know, uh, you know, developing policies and procedures aren't enough. They're, they're useless if they're not communicated and laid, at, laid out in, in plain English, not legalese. Um, you know, work with your procurement group, work with senior management, make sure it's clear and workable and consistently applied. If it's not, and I've seen this as well, it can lead to one of those worst kind of situations where, you know, you fire somebody for contravening the policy and they legitimately say that they didn't know what they did was wrong. And, and so then you get sued for wrongful dismissal. You need to be able to demonstrate that the, the policy covered a particular area, that it was clear and that you communicated it to them. Optimally, uh, you need to be able to show that they were trained or they signed off on the policy. Um, you know, I've had to prove this before where you've actually had to show, hey, this person came to the training, they signed in, uh, they signed off on the policy and therefore you can enforce it. Also uh, critical not to have gaps in your policy because people will pursue those gaps if you have them. Common examples that I've seen people using procurement cards, um, people using uh, a, an emergency uh, purchases type of arrangement or people splitting up uh, purchases so they can get underneath uh, limits. So 
you know, all these things. Look at the ways that, you know, people can use gaps to get around uh, your policies. And finally, you need to enforce the policy. If, and, and I've seen this too, where people have great policy, our companies have great policies, um, but people aren't follow, following them because they know nothing's going to happen if they, if they don't. So you need to enforce the ball. Um, and if you don't, you're going to have uh, you're going to have consistent abuse. So you you need to follow up and ensure that that people are disciplined. Next slide, please. So I think everybody knows how important it is to um, you know have a due diligence program. Um, but you really need to know who you're doing business with in your supply chain. Um, you know, have they been involved in, in bid rib rigging or corruption or money laundering or insider trading? All these things are important to, to know um, because you need to know who you're doing business with. Do they have ties to the government or do they have, you know, ties to even the mafia? Um, you know, if you don't know these things, you could be sitting on a ticking time. So make sure you you risk assess your counterparties and uh, and then do the work on them. The risk assessment process is really important. Uh, clearly, a vendor, for example, that you know supplying you with pens in in Canada is not a high risk counterparty. But you know if you have an agent, for example, in in West Africa that's registered in, in the British Virgin Islands and has ties to the Russian mafia, there's a super high risk uh, organization that you need to do a ton of due diligence on um, to make sure that you can actually do business with them. So for each of your risk assessment levels, make sure that you have uh, predetermined procedures uh, so that people can't get around them. You know, it, hey, if it's a risk to assess of this and it's, and it's a very objective process, um, what do you need to do? You know, litigation scans, um, sanction list reviews, interviews, and of course, filling out a, a detailed questionnaire um, that the, the vendor company uh, needs to, to fill out. You know, all companies expect this now, so it's not a big deal to ask for it. And then, you know, don't just get this questionnaire back and then file it away. Um, I've seen that happen too. You need to do follow procedures. You know, if, if they're filling out the questionnaire, for example, they say, hey, you know, we don't have a code of conduct and we don't do any training in code of conduct in our company. Well, you got to follow up on that. Um, you know, they may have to adopt yours or, or whatever it is. And I guess the, the final thing I'd say with this is that, um, you know, you need to do ongoing procedures for those high risk companies. Don't just, you know, uh, get them embedded into your, your vendor list and then we're all good. Um, you know, if they're high risk, you need to do ongoing scans um, and you need to embed this into your, um, your M&A process as well. Uh, don't just assume that the company you're acquiring did proper due diligence on all of their, uh, on all their supply chain as well. Um, that, that can be um, just an, an awful thing to inherit. And I've seen that happen several times as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the, the gifts and entertainment policy is, is quite important. Um, you know, so many times uh, gifts and entertainment is the method of, of bribery. And so you need to nail this one down. It's, it's amazing how far a series of, you know, really good meals, gift cards and hockey games will go in incentivizing staff to give a vendor repeat business. So, you know, what I've seen works well is that you need to have a really clear policy and you need to audit against it. Um, you need to know, make sure your staff know the policy and also that your vendors know and agree to your policy so that they can be blacklisted if they try and go against it. Um, you should keep a log of requests for transparency purposes and this should go right to the top. I had our chairman of the board, our CEO come to me uh, you know, with gifts and entertainment stuff and say, listen, I got invited to this, you know, this, you know, and, and we would talk about it. And I'd ask some questions like, okay, how will this not impair your objectivity? And, uh, and then we, we'd have a discussion, I'd log the discussion. And so it was there, if anybody challenged it, we had transparency, we had records. Um, and kind of the final thing I'd say about this is middle management needs to be involved in this. Um, 
if your middle management is seeing their staff engaging with a vendor, they should make sure, you know, hey, you know, what are you doing? Um, you know, how are you complying with the policy? How are you making sure that your objectivity is impaired in this? Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, these days, um, you really need to consider cybercrime to pr protect your procurement system from abuse. Um, you know, there's there's phishing, uh, there's spoofing, um, are some of the most common attempts, people trying to impersonate your CEO or your CFO. Um, you really need to nail this down to protect your procurement systems. I've seen so many of these things happen. And I'll tell you another one that, that's really rampant is there's people from all over the world that are hacking into your suppliers and they're getting enough information on your suppliers so that they can try and change uh, the bank accounts in your system and so that you send the money to the wrong bank account. And, uh, and the, the reason that you don't hear about this, even though it's happening all the time, is that companies are so embarrassed that they've done this, that they've paid the wrong vendor. Um, it's way big, bigger than you think and you gotta nail that one down. Um, this has been talked about before um, by a previous panelist and it's, you know, segregation of duties and just how important it is. So I won't talk about that too much, but it's just, it's just super important. Uh, you need to have different people involved and um, you, you need to make sure that uh, there's collaboration when you're looking at uh, yeah, new vendors. Um, and then you know, setting up controls isn't enough. You need to be auditing the control to make sure that people aren't working around them. People are very inventive. I've seen this over my years. You know, you put in controls, you think you're solid, and then people are working around them. And I'll tell you that auditing in itself is a control. Because if people know you're, you're auditing, they're not gonna do stuff. Um, you know, people used to think that in, a, in the company, people, my CEO even said to me, oh, I, I know, Paul, that you look over all my expense reports. I didn't. But the fact that he thought I did, I wasn't going to tell him that I wasn't. <laughs> so, you know, it keeps people honest. And uh, people can think you're looking at every single thing. Well, that's good. You're not. You can't possibly, but it's a good thing. So um, next slide, please. And so the last thing um, that I'll talk about is just communication. And I, I can't overemphasize the importance of communication. And an example is the hotline. The hotline, uh, whistleblower hotline is so valuable. I had so many things come through the hotline, but it was because I was constantly communicating to people to use it. And um, you know, every time I did training on anti-corruption, I talked about the hotline and just how important it is. I said, you know, I can't go around finding out all the abuses that are going on, but you guys see it. And here's how you'll, you'll find it. Here's, here's the red flags. Um, that you should look out for and give me a call and I'll make sure that I, you know, look into it right away. Um, so that that's really important. Um, you know, we talk a lot about tone from the top in companies, um, but I would say tone from the middle is more important. You know, every CEO talks about the importance of ethics, um, but many of them don't walk the talk. What really impresses me is when I go into a company and I see middle management walk in the talk and uh, they're showing it's important by you know evaluating staff on ethics training staff themselves promoting the hotline you know ensuring uh, gifts and entertainment compliance and you know talking about the procurement policy and how important it is to comply with it um, you need to be out there in the company promoting um, you know what are the red flags help people to be able to understand what they are and you know, develop a list and communicate it. And also what are the regulations uh, that are very important for people to be aware of? Uh, there's linked regulations um, to, to anti-corruption such as you know, uh, compliance with the Criminal Finances Act, anti-money laundering, Sarbanes-Oxley, privacy legislation, anti-competition legislation, I mean, the list goes on, Modern Slavery Act, insider trading. Um, many of these things are, are linked. And so you need to arm people with the information uh, to what, what do these things mean and how do you make sure that um, people are complying with them. So, 
that's it for me. Um, thank you. On to you, Daniela. Thank you so much. I'm just uh, just waiting for a little bit so we can all we could all appear. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Those they were absolutely fantastic, and I look forward now to a period of questions and answers. And I I encourage um, all participants to please type up your questions on the Q and A's, and I will try my my mostest to make sure that we that we go through them. So I look forward to receiving your questions um, as soon as soon as you can. But while we wait for questions to come in, I do have uh, I do have a few questions of my own. So I'd actually like to um, perhaps go back to Neil and you know we talk about we talk about anti corruption, especially within the procurement process. And um, I think that it's interesting for when we when we talk about real cases and real events. And I was wondering whether you could tell us any case where you personally witnessed a major example of corrupt abuse of public sector procurement regulations. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the sad answer to this is in many, many, many occasions, um, procurement abuse is so widespread. Uh, we work in many countries and it's widespread in the developed countries and the developing countries. And what we've what we've found from our experience is that most countries worldwide have first class procurement laws and regulations. Um, even sort of newly developing countries have good laws. Uh, and it says everything that has to be done. But what we find is massive abuse, open naked abuse of the procurement laws. But it also happens in developing countries. In the UK, unfortunately, we've just seen extraordinary abuse of procurement regulations because of the COVID um, situation. Uh, and a, they declared an emergency in Parliament a year ago, and subsequently most procurement for the, the COVID emergency has been placed um, effectively single sourced without competition and without any public disclosure. And we've just had a court case brought by an NGO in the UK to take the UK government to court to require it to disclose 15 billion pounds worth of contracts, which are a let on a single source without um, complying with the transparency regulations and the government's admitted that they haven't done that they haven't published but they still haven't published so it's, it's a, like it's a naked open abuse uh, of procurement and the contracts have been given to um, contacts of the conservative party so we have a, here in the uk a massive abuse of emergency and, and that i think is one of the most common things worldwide in my experience is abuse of emergencies you get countries which declare an emergency because the roads are in bad condition and therefore but three or four years later they're still trying to place a contract to repair the roads on an emergency procurement um, we also see massive uh, abuse where from beginning to end the, um, the process has been hijacked you know the um, procurement people choose a certain number of contractors who are in a cartel put them on the pre-qualification list the evaluation budget is increased by 30% to allow a higher price going in. The minister chooses which the company will win. And then, you know, the corruption goes on into the construction phase. So I think what we see mainly is not just tinkering with um, procurement regulations and weak regulations. We see massive naked abuse by developing and developed country governments of the regulations which are there. And the public is powerless to do anything about it because you challenge them in the courts and, and nothing happens. So sadly, we've seen a lot and we go on and on and on and on banging the drum about what's got to be put in place. But um, we've got a long way to go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one of the biggest takeaways is always to remember that corruption is not something that is exclusive to the global south right it happens it happens everywhere and anywhere mm. uh, absolutely absolutely yeah. we we have a question as well from um from from our our participants and one is from nicole barrett for david um david is the evaluation process for bids the same for private bidders as it is for government bidders so uh, thanks for the question so i think the short answer is no. Um, I think in terms of public procurement, 
uh, especially in, in um, you know, Canada, that there's much, there's a heavy, heavy accountability to the public uh, just because we're spending uh, the public's money uh, on these projects. So there's a lot of time spent uh, to make sure that everything that you're doing leads to generating um, the best value as possible for the taxpayers. That's kind of our, uh, our mantra. And I've been through you know, several procurements and um, quite often I'll work with people who, you know, they work on the private sector side as a, as a technical advisor and they're um, providing support during the evaluation. And time and again, they'll say, you know, I can't believe the steps you take and the process that you make us go through, um, you know, and, and that's just the way it is. And it's just about, you know, executing on the, the process uh, because I, th I think it's effective in my opinion versus, you know, people that have said where they've worked on private sector uh, procurements and, you know, they get three bids in and you've got the, uh, the owner of a senior person looking at those and, you know, one binder is this big and one's this big and they just pick the smaller one because they say they don't have time to read the bigger one. Um, but I think, in, you know, in the corporate realm, uh, a lot of the principles um, should, should apply. I think at the end of the day, you know, it, it, there's accountability to the shareholder for value. And it's really about encouraging comp competition and having a fair process so that you get the best value uh, in either circumstance. Excellent. So I, I just um, I, I saw that Nicole has a question, but I just wanted to to go to go to another question that we have, and we'll go back to Nicole's question in a minute. But um, uh, we have a question from Samina Ula, which is often there are tight timelines tied to critical path for contract execution. And I think this is anybody that works in construction or works with contracts, the pressure of being on time and on budget is one of the biggest, the biggest issues. Anyway, her question is, how do you justify fairness monitor, monitor, monitoring in those situations when urgency and emergency are the antithesis of transparency? And maybe John, you'd be the best person to answer that. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but the, uh, the, the fairness monitoring is not, it, I've never seen it hold up the procurement process. It goes on in the background. It's like a program running in behind your main program. So it doesn't hold up the process. And um, it just doesn't. So it, it's, it's justified from that perspective. It's a really two different things. Yes, you want, the contract executed to preserve schedule and costs for budget. Um, but it's really irrelevant to the fairness monitoring itself, which is during the procurement process up to the time construction starts. If there's a major issue, then I think both parties would agree it should be held up until it's been resolved. And it just should be like there's, um, we're, we're now finding in British Columbia, it's a very tight market. It's very, from the point of view of capacity and participants, we're getting projects worth over a billion dollars as two bidders. And uh, there's that's great concern about whether or not the successful bidder has gone through a fair process. So it, it might hold up execution. Mm -hmm. it, just, it may hold it up. Um, and going back to David's uh, comment on, or the question to David on the difference between public and private sector procurements, Yes, private procurements are less prone to adopt the scrutiny that's given to public projects, but there's a keen awareness of private projects being required to abide by fairness principles. There's a half a dozen leading cases in the courts in Canada that outlined what you must do in a procurement, public or private, a case called Ron Engineering, another case called MB, MBA or NBA, uh, there's a, another case that deals with uh, undisclosed preferences, called Chinook aggregates. Another case that deals with the ability of uh, the ability of a project sponsor to take a quote nuanced view of the situation and reject the low bidder because of experience with some other projects that were un unpleasant. So the private sector is still bound by those legal requirements in those cases. Do they abide by them all the time? Heaven knows, no, because there's no, there's no imposed scrutiny on the process in the private sector. Um, the, the, sec the 
sponsor itself would have to engage scrutiny. Whereas in the public sector, there's a mandate from above that uh, when, part, when infrastructure VCs managing these projects, they do engage a fairness monitor. So it's imposed in those cases, unlike the private sector. Thank you, John. Thank you for, for that explanation. Um, we have a question from Susan. Um, Neil and uh, the Global Infrastructure Anti-Corruption Center have been working to improve procurement practices for a long time now. Um, he says that a lot of progress still needs to happen, but if you could name some improvements, what would they be? I think uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest uh, improvements would be corporate compliance uh, rather than government compliance. I think uh, we've seen corporations who 20 years ago would um, routinely bribe as a matter of course worldwide and treat it as being part of the uh, necessary part of business uh, and who wouldn't talk about it or discuss it with anyone because it was so secret. 20 years later, we see open uh, collaboration between corporations in professional and business associations and ethical programs. Uh, and we see a lot of very, very good quality compliance in the private sector, although albeit a huge amount of corrupt practice still taking place. But we've seen a division effectively, I think, between ethical companies and, and the un unethical. We have a, a two tier corporate world at the moment. But I think the biggest breakthrough I would say on that sign has been the development and publication of ISO 37001, which you know is a, it, the first ever international standard certifiable of a, a corporate program for um, corporations, and which was agreed to by a working group, you know, with, with effectively 59 countries involved in it. So we've moved from a stage where corp corruption was tolerated and, and accepted to where 59 countries can get together and produce minimum standards for corporations, which can be certified to. So I think we've seen massive progress, but nothing really, we haven't got to the ultimate outcome yet, which is an honest public sector, uh, you know, which is controlling the procurement. If your people running the procurement in some governments are corrupt, if your ministers are corrupt, mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do about it. And that's where we have failed totally in the last 20 years is, is to get integrity into public life worldwide. So uh, what, what you've just mentioned, I think is a perfect segue to the, to the next question. We have a question from Deepo, which, uh, which asks, in Africa, the main reason why corruption thrives is simply because institutions are not independent, like in the developed world. What measures have been put in place by governments of developed countries like Canada and organizations like Transparency International to assist institutions across Africa to really fight corruption? Anybody wants to take this one? What are some of the core, if you were going to distill, distill from an institutional perspective, three things that, um, that, that, that governments need to do in order to fight corruption, what, what would they be? Joe? No? And if nobody? <laughs> well, I, ideally, I suppose what you'd want to do is what, uh, get someone to fill David's role in foreign countries. <laughs> Have an right. infra infrastructure in Nigeria, Absolutely. infrastructure in Rwanda, like whatever. You need that. Um, of course, the danger in those countries is then they, that organization itself will become corrupt. Like when five soldiers show up with AK 47s at your desk and ask you to perform in a certain way, you're gonna perform in a certain way, regardless of what the government policy is. It's, it is very tough to avoid, you know, I'm he hearing the examples, I've heard them before. It's very tough to adopt any sort of uh, democratic process in these countries to enforce fairness, like, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, Daniela. Maybe I could respond with the um, experience of the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network because it, it had some, some big successes um, in, in Africa, um, is specifically Nigeria, um, because it was the, the worst situation in the ports uh, for all the shipping companies. And so the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network is, is a group of all the shipping companies and got together and worked through collective action uh, with the government in Nigeria 
and basically said, listen, you know, we've we've got, um, you know, this essentially a cartel of shipping companies that it's going to be disastrous for your country if you if if you can't get goods shipped in and out of, of your ports. And we're having such a time with corruption. Can you help us? And the government was extremely willing at that point uh, to to help out and and worked uh, with the MACN over a period of years to root out corruption. And so not perfect, um, but but it worked really well. They did training in country. They they set up a whistleblower a hotline and a whole bunch of other things uh, that really helped to to move the needle. So. That's just one example of how things can be done. But um, yeah, aside from that, I'm not sure that, you know, uh, a government can do something like that, but certainly a group like MACN did have some. No, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for that. So I just wanted, it's, I think, oh, anyway, it's just, just, to, just to finish off that point. I, yeah, I think it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult question and, incredible, and I think we're ultimately the anti-corruption game is a bit of a whack-a-mole game. No matter how many times you whack it, it just keeps coming up and you gotta keep finding new ways of figuring out how best to deal with it. Now we have a follow-up question for David from, from Nicole. And the question is, to what extent do public procurement evaluations consider whether bidders will observe Canadian law and policies beyond direct financial benefits to taxpayers? For example, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Oh. Sorry, David. Yeah, you're yeah, mood, I think. Oh, you're it's definitely uh, an, an important consideration in terms of the value, you know, proposals that um, bidders submit that they have to be able to um, acknowledge to, um, you know, that they aren't, um, there's certain specific criteria that they have to be able to acknowledge that they aren't um, on the wrong side of um, Canadian law and also um, internationally. So in, in cross-referencing with um, federal, the federal government's um, lists with respect to um, international uh, relations with specific um, countries uh, of origin and, and then also with respect to uh, senior representatives of, a, uh, of an organization that's bidding uh, in terms of um, convictions or incarceration, um, that, that that's all part of the uh, evaluation process is looking at that uh, background and understanding exactly which, which firms are bidding and um, you know, looking, at, looking at their uh, background. So just beyond their, you know, their technical knowledge and their financial capacity. Um, and those are, those are issues that have come up it, it's it's fairly rare, but it, it does come up, and there is provisions in the process uh, for us to examine that and, and be able to say that uh, it's it's not a concern, or if it is, that we have to do further investigation and, and due diligence to understand um, exactly what the what the situation is. But and then so that's I mean as far as procurement goes, and then in terms of the the actual contractor, one of the first things is that they have to. Um, abide by all uh, Canadian laws. Um, so as long as it's you know it's law and it's a legal requirement, then they would be um, responsible for adhering to that. Excellent, thank you, David. Um, I actually have a question for Joe. Joe, um, I was wondering whether you could comment on options that are available to companies that encounter impact to their critical supply chain, and then of course that impacts their entire business operation especially when, 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 when this occurs during a regime change or a government policy revision, such as when tariffs change, that benefits specific individuals or parties in power. He, uh, that question, I was hoping uh, uh, some others would uh, jump into and, and hopefully add some advice to this as well. I think from a corporate perspective, and this relates to that last question about um, uh, relating to Africa, um, and in fact, in many jurisdictions, even in the developed world, the, I guess you could say the last few years down south of us, um, you get a regime change. And 
rules, policies, everything else changes as well. So it's not just in the developing world, it's also in the developed world. That has impact on business. Um, and there's a, a term that I'd like to re, uh, come back to frequently in this sort of case is uh, it's a Latin term called lex mercatoria, uh, translates to merchant law. Um, and the first uh, aspect of this in history goes back to Roman times. And then it emerged again in about 1000 AD that in particular in Europe, um, the governments that be in regimes and controls, and I see this now happening again, is deferring to the economic powers and finding ways for industry and business to guide the path. There's vulnerabilities to that in terms of uh, if they're not so ethical. If you allow uh, business to just go for their own benefit, um, stuff happens. If you encourage business, um, and I think we're starting to see that in the past decade in particular, um, businesses are starting to realize the power and importance of integrity um, and loyalty to their markets. When that happens and that's encouraged, then the businesses and, and whether it be SMEs or large corporations, as we saw what a couple of years ago, the CEOs in the US of over 200 uh, Fortune 500 companies came out with a common platform of uh, operating with integrity. When you encourage that, that becomes the, the momentum in all jurisdictions. Then, if you can empower that level of integrity, which includes everything from the panel members, particularly uh, uh, Neil's checklist uh, with respect to ISO 37001 and the integrity platform of procurement, then the jurisdictions have to follow suit because um, I think it was Paul talking about the ports in Nigeria, that cartel on shipping, when they uh, expose that weakness to Nigeria and Nigeria realizes that their economic uh, wherewithal and, and health is at stake, then they have to listen. So that's that aspect of merchant law. If we continue down that path, um, we also have to consider the due diligence on corporations to maintain that integrity for the benefit of the Marshall McLuhan Global Village. Um, that's the ultimate benefit to, can, to stimulate the economy for the well-being. When that, and again, when you do that, where there's money flowing, the dark side will be watching and looking for ways to tap into that, whether it's electronically, which seems to be the biggest way and diverting money. Um, so we have to have other safeguards. But I think that's more powerful than expecting any state um, and this is part of John Ruggie's framework document on human rights. He puts so much on the state and then the next um, level of protection on human rights at the enterprise level. But what about civil society's responsibility to themselves? And that is the stimulus that we see happen around the world with respect to the economy, keeping the economy going, but in an ethical fashion and developing safeguards. And that's up to the states to develop the safeguards and the checklist on the economic drivers and watch how we see the developing world will want to jump on board with that as long as it's ethical thanks absolutely yes thanks joe so i'm going to switch gears a little bit because i think that uh i, I think that this is this is uh this is this is a concern i'd like to to direct the question to john but then if if, if others have have any comments i think that would be great um John, it's not uncommon today to find that many procurement documents provide a wide discretion that is given to project sponsors and evaluation committees to receive and accept non-compliant proposals, additional and substitute information for already for information already provided, and to really that to to give themselves a certain amount of discretion. Um, I think that'd be interesting to hear first your thoughts, John, and then of course anybody else from the panel. Well, how appropriate is this broad discretion? Thank you. Um, it, this is an interesting story. I, I, we don't have a lot of time, so I can't tell the whole story. This is, this is like a cat and mouse game. 
Um, a decade ago, um, there was a decision came out of the Supreme Court of Canada, um, su which suggested that you obviously could not accept as a um, procurement sponsor, a non-compliant bid, a bid that didn't comply with your RFP conditions and so on, or, or a, a proposal that breached fairness principles. You couldn't accept it. You couldn't accept a non-compliant bid because you didn't have the right to do so on the face of the RFP documents. Well, everybody across the country put in the RFP documents. You now have the ability to accept non-compliant bids. And, and so they could be got one step ahead of the courts. And the courts made another decision uh, on um, discretion given to you on a um, waiver, waiving, waiving compliance of certain conditions and how far you could go with that, how far the discretion went. And so that part of the RFP documentation was also tightened up. You could waive, waive requirements, you could ask for additional information. You could actually effectively negotiate with proponents in the hope that they would turn out to be the, the favored uh, proponent. Well, of course, that, that takes you right back to where all this started with Ron Engineering saying we need an amendment and adjustment to the Canadian procurement system because at the present time, it's really unfair and it's and in disrepute. So you can't, you, you, back then, 10 years ago, it's, the court said you can't accept non-compliant bids. You can't give yourself such a broad discretion so as to make the system appear unfair. Yet now the courts are saying, if you do that in your RFP documents and everybody signs up to it, when they enter into the contest, uh, I agree to participate in this contest. I sign the RFP and comply with the RFP, which includes this broad discretion. You're bound by it, according to the courts today. So I wonder, and I wouldn't mind some comments on this from other people. Um, have we come full, are we coming full circle, wanting to guard against corruption and bribery and the like? Um, and now, not allowing bribery and corruption, obviously, but now with this broad discretion, permitting the procurement um, authority itself going way outside the what we understood was a fair process, uh, amend, getting bids to be amended and then accepting them. That's, it seems to me it's, it's no different than what you, what you used to call bid shopping. So, um, it, no court has suggested that yet. As a matter of fact, they seem to be on board with you contract to do whatever you want to do. But at some point in time, someone's going to take a challenge that that broad discretion given to procurement authorities is against public policy in the public sector and therefore unenforceable. Hasn't been done yet, but you can certainly see the prospect of that happening. Thanks, John. Joe, you, you, had, uh, you had some comments? Yeah, the um, kind of a difference aspect between government and private sector uh, with regards to this, and I can kind of talk to both. Um, I used to be a, a director in a large global engineering company, and uh, one aspect uh, uh, project that I remember with that, a uh, major government contract and it came down to us and one other bidder um, and this is where there's a weakness in in a, my perspective in a government system where you know we hear things about they got to go with the, some jurisdictions impose a rule you got to go with the lowest bidder etc mm -hmm. um, but you also got to look at an aspect that some companies out there are professionals at tendering but not the work. Whereas the ones who are professionals and experts at the work are not very good at tendering. They're not very good at marketing themselves. And this creates a vulnerability, particularly from the ones that are the experts at tendering. They want to push the agenda to make the tender process amenable to their tendering expertise. Whereas the ones that have the skill sets to do it are caught. And this one project where we were uh, down to two bidders. What was interesting is the other was selected for a major multi-billion dollar project. They went and got the contractors that we had lined up. 
we had it all worked out for the major machinery, et cetera. These guys, the other bidder, didn't even have the contractors listed in the tender document. They said, we'll figure it out later. They went and contracted ours. So you got to be careful about the vulnerabilities in that process. From a private sector, um, particularly in my practice, I have four criteria when I'm putting out tenders. And flexibility wasn't always an, an aspect of that. But I want to know more about who's presenting the bids as opposed to how polished their bids are. Because when I'm entering a contract, particularly on long-term supply for a mining operation that can go over a decade, it's not the initial cost that's important. It's that 10-year uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. And that, that operating cost is worth far more than the capital cost. And that relationship is critical to that and how they're going to operate in certain jurisdictions. So we have to be careful how we develop this tender process. Yeah. Any more comments? I saw some nodding all across. Well, I guess I would just comment on the on the broad discretion, and I think it's a very interesting uh, topic. But it's really about with broad discretion comes broad responsibility. Uh, so there's there's an element of you know, in its application, is it being done, you know, fairly? Um, it's, it's a little bit different than, you know, particularly like a, like a corruption issue. I think, I think what John's saying is right, is that if the, if the process, you know, allows for broad discretion and the people participating, they sign up for that. And, you know, that's basically the deal, but I think it's incumbent on whoever's running the procurement to be very careful um, with those types of things. I think some people refer to them as nuclear options in, in procurement um, to be handled very delicately because at the end of the day, the, you know, the long-term success of any program or government or implementing of a capital plan is the confidence of the market uh, to continue to, to bid on your projects. And so it's, it's just, um, something that has to be handled very carefully. Hey, David, I might pick up on that. I, on a couple of very large projects, none, none of which were infrastructure BC projects. I've seen that discretion used to save a project. So if you've got two bidders, um, neither of them really make the mark, but one's a bit closer to the mark than the other. So you take them aside and negotiate with them to save your project. So there is value to the discretion given, I, don't get me wrong. It's a very valuable clause from the point of view of both the bidders and the uh, procuring authority. These big projects, it used to be that the price was two and a half million dollars of cost just to bid on the project. Now it's five to $10 million for a billion dollar project. So to get people to encourage them to participate in that kind of process, they have to have faith that that discretion clause will be exercised judicially, judiciously, and not uh, in an unfair, untransparent backroom manner. So it's a dicey, it's a dicey area, and more so when you've got a tight market, which is jammed on capacity, and doesn't have the financial capacity to handle the number of projects they're bidding on. It's it's a very very mm, difficult RFP provision, the discretion given to the procuring authority to save projects or to save a bid that's otherwise deficient and non-compliant. Just there, it's always struck me as, wow, that's, uh, that's a pretty heavy load on the evaluators to switch on the discretion button and try and fix up a bid which otherwise would be non-compliant. So you got to tread very carefully. So I watched in my job, I watched that. I've not seen one fail because of the discretion clause, but I've seen it come very close to the mark. You should do another step forward and you would have crossed the boundary. So. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm going to switch gears once again a little bit, uh, just with regards to one of the key components of, you know, anti-corruption compliance um, programs that corporations have, and uh, obviously uh, public sector has, are whistleblower hotlines. And 
Paul, you mentioned the importance of uh, whistleblower hotlines and, you know, and we have a question from the audience as well. Well, first of all, you know, how do you get the maximum value out of a hotline and how do you ensure that you're effectively communicating it? And secondly, and this comes from, comes from our audience, in Canada, whistleblower laws have been vigorously criticized and do you share this view? So more specifically, are the whistleblower provisions in BC's public integrity law sufficient to protect whistleblowers? So perhaps we'll go. We'll start with Paul, and then we'll see uh, who has any other comments. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll take your your first question, and I'll leave the second question for somebody else who maybe understands the the laws a little better than me. <laughs> but I can talk about the practical experience for sure. Um, you know, I have a lot of experience with, with hotlines and I mentioned before communication and how important communication is, but I'll elaborate on that a little bit because it's not just telling people about the hotline, it's making sure they understand how important it is to the organization. And there, there are a number of ways you can do this. Um, one is to uh, make sure they know that when, when something is uh, communicated through the hotline, Act on it immediately. If we, I would, I would drop everything. If we got something that looked real, um, you know, I'd be on the plane the next day to Singapore or wherever it came from, and I would immediately um, let people in the office know I am here because I got a whistleblower hotline complaint. If if I could share that, it depends on the circumstances. Um, I'd let people know so that they'd know. Hey, man, these guys take this so seriously. They they drop everything. And then if we find stuff, again, you have to you have to consider the nature of it, and you know make sure you if if the person wants anonymity, et cetera, et cetera. But to the extent that you can share stuff when you when you deal with something and somebody's terminated, et cetera. Now I had this one situation where the next day it was in the Philippines. The next day I was in front of the um, um, the, all of the uh, this the the the, the office. And I said, listen, we just had this happen. We had a hotline come in. Uh, I, I, I investigated it. I dealt with it. Uh, the person was terminated. And uh, this is the result of you coming forward and giving us stuff. So that's really important. And then also communicating it to your vendors is so critical. Um, your vendors need to know that you have a whistleblower hotline because how else are they going to report on stuff? Like, say your employees are going out to vendors and asking for uh in incentives and we had this happen again a number of times where vendors used the hotline and we followed up on it and was, sometimes we even said uh thank you with with gift cards or just a nominal something but to say hey this is really important to us because you have to recognize that a whistleblower has no incentive to blow the whistle you have to give them some incentive and i'm not talking about money i'm talking about just you know even a thank you like this is so important to the company and, but we, we did do things like gift cards as well and, and, uh, and, a, and a real thank you. If they didn't want to be anonymous, then we could do something like that. So anyway, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Do we have any comments on the, the BC whistleblower law and whether, whether there's an agreement with, uh, with whether it, goes, it is sufficient? There's, um, there's a Public Interest Disclosure Act which was passed in December of 2019. I'm, I'm not aware of it. the BC's on buds has can, has launched one investigation into a complaint under the legislation. There is other legislation available as the Whistleblower Protection Act, 2015. So they are given the whistleblower is given protection by that legislation. But I want to say overriding both of these, it's not the most popular legislation with the electorate. It's a big brother, it's like 1984, whatever that Orson Welles movie was called. And it has received previously in the field of an, reporting environmental offenses, to be very unpopular. You got workers overlooking the shoulder of other workers uh, suspiciously and multiple unfound complaints um, under the Whistleblower Act. So it's it's, it's here, it's in BC, it's not widely used, to my knowledge. Um, and historically, it has proved to be very unpopular. Thanks, John. 
So when we look at when we look at the anti-corruption work and all the efforts that are made, um, we we continuously trying to improve and, and and trying to find creative ways of of, of doing things in a way that is, is better and more in a way tries to control the anti-corruption risk. And I was hoping that to turn back to you, Neil. And you, you showed us a list of what, 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 what are considered to be sort of the, the 16 most important points. And what, what do you think you would most like to see put into better practice out of that list? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Neil, you're on mute. Apologies for that. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, as I said, all the things on the list are very, very important. But if I were to pick out three, like you asked, I think I'd pick out three which would make the most difference to, you know, sophisticated economies with sophisticated procurement systems in place, like you know, the Canada, the USA, UK, e European Union, in the sense that the big three, I would say, which need massive improvement, one is transparency. I just don't think there's enough transparency in the public sector, and I'm talking public sector here, public sector procurement. In the, you know, we must know as the public, you know, what the specification is for contracts, and and after all the bids have been evaluated, we need to know what the bids were. Okay, we can keep confidential specific drawings or technology, which is genuinely pr proprietary, but everything else we have the right to know to know whether the right company was awarded the contract and, and talking about discretion if discretion was used whether it was properly used and we also need to know who owns these companies who are the beneficial owners who are the intermediaries who are the agents who are the suppliers who are the subcontract if it's all put out there on the internet which is so easy now because most bids are electronic and if they're done in paper there's normally an electronic copy it can just be downloaded onto a website and people can sift through it you know over a whiskey at night if they want to and, and they can find out who, who the companies are, what their prices are, and they can report on these whistleblowing lines. They can say that company's price for aggregates was extremely high, and they're, they're using a supplier who's connected to the minister. You know, it's a massive opening up of data, which we just don't do. Um, and it's crazy that it's not done. And governments resist doing that on the basis of confidentiality commercially, and the public won't understand, you know, which is frankly arrogant. So I think massive full disclosure is, is point number one. Um, the second point, and I'm delighted to hear from John and David about your fairness monitor. I think independent monitoring is absolutely critical and it's not done enough. And I'm, I'm so pleased that it, it seems to be working in BC. And I would sort of, we've always been pushing for monitoring right the way through, right the way through the initial project selection design process, through procurement, right the way through project construction expert independent monitors who sit on the project, watch it with a duty to report. You know, I think that could really massively uh, reduce corruption with skilled independent monitoring. And like you're describing it right the way through the project. And we don't have that in most countries. Thirdly, let's use ISO 37001. You know, we've got it, we've got this wonderful gold standard, but it's not being taken up in Canada, USA, Britain, Europe, as it's just really not. Um, and I think it should be a requirement that all public sector procuring entities should mm -hmm. themselves get certified to ISO 37001. A public sector body is just the same as a private sector body. It has management, leadership, finance, accounts, decisions. Get them on, uh, certified by a proper certifier and require all tenderers over a minimum value threshold to be independently certified and produce the certificate. I think that'll be a massive, massive increase in integrity because the ISO standard itself requires all organizations to control the supply chain. So it's like a pyramid. If you get certified, you must control your supply chain and your personnel. You must control your procurement. You must control your money. So if you've got certified to that, you have to control everyone below you. So it's like a sort of cascade. So to my mind, those are the three big ones, transparency, monitoring, ISO certification. Joe, thanks. Thanks. Neil? Just want to comment on Neil's last comment um, regarding that certification. And uh, I don't know if I came across or uh, people understood during the introductions. Um, I was on the Canadian committee to the ISO 37001, and that's where Neil and I first met. Um, I absolutely agree with that. And that certification, that kind of standard, 
while some jurisdictions were adopting ISO 37001 into their state laws, um, building that certification into a system supports the merchant law, Lex, Lex Mercatoria. And that draws attention to that degree of integrity and certification process throughout the, uh, the network. Um, but I also wanted to make a comment earlier on the whistleblower um, aspect and modification of laws. I'm going to say this as a, I was a whistleblower, 2003, um, and it was a very difficult time in my life and career. Um, and since then, and that was before we had any substantial laws in Canada. Uh, in my view, as we saw in U.S. politics over the last few years and other circumstances, being a whistleblower, you don't take lightly, whether there are laws to protect you or not. There is a, a voice inside that speaks louder than you can imagine that you have to do something. And I think that any whistleblower that's gonna come out in today's world where whistleblowers are attacked personally, they have to have a reason in that listening to that voice um, that has to have a high degree of integrity and truth and seeking the truth. As such, um, what I would hope, and I've said this before in other uh, venues, I would like to see a modification of the law to perhaps modify the slander liability rules and laws specific to whistleblowers. You don't have to do it in general, but specific to this to ease that, uh, that personal attacks. And if somebody is going to personally attack a whistleblower, um, the burden of proof is eased and, and favors the whistleblower side. Um, just so that we can actually listen to the arguments as opposed to the personal attacks. That may eventually open the doors to that, the secret whistleblower and, and get to better transparency so we can get to the issues as opposed to the personalities. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story with us and for your opinion. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, we, we're, we're almost running out of time, so we just have a few more questions, I think maybe one or two. Um, I did have a question just, um, just for David. And if David, if you could give us some examples of relationships in the procurement that, that you've seen there, there that could cause a problem. Yeah, so, um, so in, interestingly, um, I guess there was one instance on a, a project where unbeknownst to um, somebody that was on the on the evaluation, um, I think it was their brother-in-law showed up on a, a bidding team. So uh, and I, I, I won't say anything on the family that doesn't you know get together enough to know that that that's a potential, but the um, so that's just a, an example where you know immediately that becomes apparent to, and the the, the disclosures are shared quite broadly that everybody is looking at them, especially with the relationship re review committee, um, that that comes up. So that's more of a I guess a reactive example, um, and others other examples have been on, you know, very very large projects where. Um, you know, somebody that's the, the technical lead for the project and who would be, you know, fairly critical and instrumental to the overall evaluation, uh, declaring that, you know, somebody on one of the other teams um, was the, you know, the best man at their wedding and is the godfather uh, to their children and disclosing that kind of a relationship. Uh, and then, then, you know, they need to step aside from the, the process. And they're basically saying that, it, it, well, I mean, objectively, that there's a potential for a conflict, but they're tacitly acknowledging that you know they don't maybe they don't even know if they would have a bias if it came down to it if it's somebody that they know. But it's just it's just that kind of um, example. So those are you know a couple of extremes, and and then I think through the through the process for it to work effectively, there's a lot of because of the people involved and you know people changing jobs and organizations. There's a lot of cross knowledge of people and you know where they've worked and so there's a lot of opportunity to to kind of probe and say well you know did you work with that person or this person and just encouraging people to um, err on the side of caution 
and disclose relationships and then leave it up to the committee to decide if it's an issue or, or if there's means to uh, mitigate. Thank you, thank you, David. I was uh, just on that note. I was on uh, I was on a, a committee once, and the discussion was about an ex husband that the person hadn't seen in ten years, and the question was whether that was going to be a perception of bias or not. Anyway, it was an interesting discussion to see whether that was uh, that was an issue. But in any event, I just wanted to take the moment now to thank this panel. It was it has been a fascinating two hours. I couldn't have learned more. It was amazing, really. Thank you very much, and. Um, I just wanted to now um, turn the word to James Cohen, who is the Executive Director of Transparency International Canada for a few, uh, for a few wrap, up, uh, wrap up words. Thank you, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And thank you to all of our panelists, uh, David, Joe, John, Neil, and Peter for bringing your expertise to uh, the participants of the anti-corruption law program. And thank you once again to Joe, uh, Joe Weiler and John Ricci um, uh, who are representing TI, well, Joe on our, our board, uh, John, former board member, longtime volunteer since then uh, for pulling this together along with UBC's uh, Allard School of Law and um, Business Law School, as well as along with iClear out there. We really appreciate our partnership in BC and in Vancouver in particular, a very lively uh, crowd out there who now the whole of Canada and beyond gets to engage with thanks to Zoom. Uh, and hopefully we won't need a pandemic in the very near future to give us a reason to all connect via Zoom. We can just do it because we want to and then we can actually see each other in person. So thank you all once again. I just wanna to flag to our participants who are remaining. If you're interested in more information about Transparency International Canada, please do join or check out our website at transparencycanada.ca. Uh, 